what I have here for you now are, are uh, you know, is a startup, a, a company that's at a very early stage, but is also doing something kind of really unique and interesting. Um, and the company is called Peffin, and we have, I'll start from uh, my left, we have Ramya Joseph, who is Peffin's founder. Uh, before she got to Peffin, she was the VP of proprietary trading at Goldman. Uh, she has a lot of degrees in various computery subjects, such as <laughs> AI and uh, financial engineering. Um, uh, to her right is John Crittenden, who is Peffin's director of business development and investment strategy. John, um, had a, had a stint at Acorns, which is one of these early robo-advisors. Peffin is sort of doing something adjacent to that. We'll talk about that. He also spent some time at uh, Morgan Stanley. So uh, I'm going to get right into it. Ramia, uh, let's start with you. Um, you know, so many of these kind of fintech companies that we're seeing now kind of were born right around 2008, 2009, 2010. You know, it, it, maybe I'm making this up, but it feels like a lot of companies were sort of young people kind of experiencing the financial crisis and kind of coming up with a response to it. And I'd just love to hear, you know, where, Peffin, I think, was founded right around this time, too. You know, mm -hmm. what were you doing in 2008, and how did that inspire this company? That's a great question. So in 2008, I was actually, uh, I was a prop trader at Goldman, <clears throat> uh, but during the credit crisis, my dad lost his job, and he was faced with an unplanned early retirement. And I come from a pretty middle-class, you know, family. And to help him out, I set up this uh, pretty huge Excel spreadsheet to navigate his retirement with his savings and Medicare and Social Security. It took me weeks to put together. Uh, I finally shared it with him, walked him through it, and the relief he felt was palpable. And to me, it really got me thinking, um, if you don't have access to somebody with this type of knowledge and this ability to help you navigate through major financial decisions, how do you do it? And you have two spectrums. You have people who can't afford the advice. And on the other end, you have financial advisors who can help if you have sufficient assets. But there was no middle ground solution that was highly personalized but still very scalable. It took me six months to actually resign from Goldman and start this company. Uh, but you know, it, that's really the, the kickstart for me, the watershed moment for me. Yeah, wow. So the idea basically being you know, take that spreadsheet and turn it into software. Yeah, not just a spreadsheet, but it's not just retirement, right? It's every major decision, buying a home, sending your kids to college, um, you know, having children. And it's, it's not goal-based, right? Every decision we make affects others down the road. So if you buy too big a home, that changes your ability to retire. If you're trying to think about Harvard, that changes other decisions down the road. If you're thinking two kids in the suburbs, really different from two kids in the city. So how do they interplay and work with each other? And then once all these plans work together, how do you actually save appropriately for the road ahead and pay down debt appropriately for the road ahead? Yeah. So John, uh, you were at Acorns. Uh, Acorns, for those of you who don't know, is one of these, it's a robo-advisor. Um, uh, basically the idea being you use software to, to pick ETFs, basically. Um, this has become a really hot category. Um, just, why don't you just, just to help people understand what a little bit deeply what Peffin's doing exactly, why don't you just sort of yeah, talk about right. the distinction between kind of like what we heard from Wealthfront this morning, you know, what, kind of what's different from what you guys are doing, what they're doing? Yeah, first off, um, we're not a robo-advisor, and we're very different. And some of those key differences are the, the, the suite of services that make up a robo-advisor, right? It's asset allocation, dollar cost averaging, rebalancing, tax loss harvesting, all done at a very low price, uh, has become a commoditized suite of services at this point. They're now priced at 25 basis points or zero. So it's a very commoditized uh, play. Yeah. We think the uh, area of value that's worth paying for is in the planning and advice. And we're a planning and advice engine. Um, that is very comprehensive and complex. Got it. Um, let's see, uh, let's look at this slide that we have about the, oh, we're looking at it right now. Um, so so there's, a, there's a big opportunity here, right? I mean, this is clearly, you know, you look at this chart and um, you know, people are interested in these services. Uh, in, in the robo world, like every, uh, every big bank, as you said, everybody's getting into this. And it, it seems like you're, you're kind of coming into a, I mean, obviously a very crowded market. I mean, how, how is, I don't know, how, how, do you, is the plan to sort of like take some of these people who might be looking at Betterment or Wealthfront and like grab them or is it a different market or who? You know, that's, a, that's a great question. So 
and, and to put things into, into context, if we look at the robo-advisor market, there's certainly great numbers of them. Uh, but if you look at now they've been in the marketplace five years, they've raised, you know, the, the, the uh, standalone platforms have raised about a billion in equity capital, right? And they've spent most of it, a lot of it on marketing. And collectively, you look at that, that top five or six robo advisors they've accumulated the assets under management about, you know, three large Merrill Lynch offices. So they just put it into some kind of context as to where we're at in that marketplace. It's a very commoditized, you know, low cost, low margin uh, lower value proposition yeah. product where Peffin is planning and advice oriented. So are we competing for the same person? Yeah, you may think so on the front end because we're a digital financial uh, platform, but what we're providing is vastly different. Okay. Um, just to, to challenge you, Ramia, you know, we talked about this uh, before we got up here, but I mean, you know, isn't like one of the kind of like amazing things about this rise of like passive investing and and these robo advisors you really don't need like a financial advisor i mean it's, it's like so easy right you just like uh just buy like a a, a D s p 500 fund and a bond fund and you know a 90 10 depending on your age and you're done you don't need to think about any of this so like why would someone need even need peffin you know it's a great question um i want to throw that on its head a little bit and say Investing is a very small aspect of the overall advisory process, right? There's a huge component to planning, to figuring out what are the priorities you want in your life and what are the preferences you're going to make around those priorities. So even when you think about something deeply personal like having kids, when do you want to have them? Do you want public versus private school? What are your childcare options, right? Are you thinking about full-time childcare, taking time off work? Are you thinking about daycare? These are highly uh, nuanced decisions that have tremendous financial impact to a person's ability to spend and save. And it's only through understanding the planning process that you can understand what do you do to save. And saving also includes paying down debt. In a lot of instances, Peffin will tell a user. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. We, we've got actually a chart about uh, the growth of student loan debt um, yeah. that we'll put up in a second. I mean, is this, you probably see it here. I mean, you yeah. see basically that, that white line, I think, is, is, is student debt. I mean, it's going through the roof. I mean, is that like a big piece of, like, of the opportunity here that yeah. you have all these young people, Absolutely. huge amounts of debt? don't know what to do with it? Absolutely, so uh, Peffin will absolutely tell you when to pay down debt and by how much to pay down. And it's part of the advisory service. There's plenty of users we actually say, do not invest right now, do not open a taxable brokerage. That is not what you do. You actually pay down your debts because dollar for dollar you're gonna save more. So the decisions that we give a user, the advice that we give a user are so deeply rooted in what matters to them and also their current financial situation, very much like what an expert financial advisor would do for you. So I would actually argue that the person who's thinking that investing is planning is exactly the user that needs to understand that's just part of the dimensions of your financial life. So you guys have, this is kind of a unique story. We were talking about this earlier, but uh, you know, Peffin is bootstrapped. It's a, it's a company with 30 employees, some, some real difficult tech. Um, uh, you've been at this for what, five years or something like that? Yeah. And John, I mean, how did you, you have these beta, group of beta users, I think you told me, what, yeah. four or 5,000? Yeah, Peffin's a, a unique platform in the space. So uh, for the first time, <clears throat> you know, we're accepting outside investment capital. By the time a product or platform is at the maturity level of Peffin, you know, they're already on a Series B at this point. This has been bootstrapped uh, from day one with uh, management and founder money. We did a multi-year beta uh, on the product with uh, between four and 5,000 users. Uh, and to build a platform of the complexity of Peffin and the capabilities of Peffin, you needed a multi-year beta to get the product yeah. to where it needed to be. No, no venture capital funded platform would have, get, would have had the patience to do a multi-year beta with four or 5,000 users. It just wouldn't happen, so, so it's, it's very unique. Let's get into the tech a little bit because I think it's so interesting. You know, uh, I think we hear these words like machine learning and AI, and I think um, you know, we kind of have a somewhat intuitive sense of w what that means. It's like the computer's making decisions for you, but Ramya, um, you get these beta users. Mm -hmm. What are you doing with them? I mean, are you basically trying to tr get the software to learn 
what makes sense for people or, or just talk yeah. us through like what's happening sure, kind of under the hood. Sure, sure, yeah. So the core of Peffin's AI is what's called a feed forward neural network. And what so, it, sorry? a feed forward neural network. Okay. okay. So you can think of it as a user comes into the platform and just by answering a few questions, we immediately understand, okay, where do you live? How does that change your tax profile? The entire US tax code is built into the system. How does that change demographics, expenses, et cetera? Various things are connected together and pushed forward through time. Now, when we give the platform to four or 5,000 users, that part of the AI was built. We launched with financial planning. And part of the AI learns your very unique spending and savings patterns through time, right? It's something that we have to learn from you, from that user's unique profile. And that's what we refined and calibrated over that two-year period. But in those two years, we weren't just doing research. We also learned from our users what features matter to them. And there were two things we learned. One is people really wanted a much more guided advisory process, so we built that. We built our entire debt management piece at that point, our investment management. So we do what a robo does. If you want to invest through us, you can. It's just optional. You can also take our advice, go to Vanguard, Fidelity, your broker dealer of choice, and execute it on your own. So. I think that's what really happened in that two year period was not only did our algorithms get smarter and better, but we actually focused on the features that users actually wanted. So uh, are people, are your users sort of going to third party uh, services? Or are they working with you when they're going to you know, invest money? Yeah, so if we, if our advice How's it break down? Yeah, so if our advice recommends you invest with us, then yes, majority okay. of our users invest with us. Not all of, all users should invest with us. We actually tell you when you shouldn't. Uh, I would also say there's quite a lot of users that have financial advisors. Okay. And what we've heard from them is it helps them feel like they're on an equal footing with their financial advisor. So when it comes time for that quarterly meeting, they're prepared, they know where their financial situation stands and they're able to have a much more engaging dialogue with their financial advisor on, on more nuanced topics as opposed to, to it being a one-sided conversation. Got it, got it. Um, and you know, one of the things about I think AI that is, and machine learning is really interesting is, um, you know, a lot of times, and I may be butchering this slightly, you can correct me, but you know, the computer is gonna look at a bunch of data and it's gonna try to come up with optimal solutions. And mm -hmm. you don't necessarily know why a given solution is picked. And this yeah. comes up a lot in the world of, say, driverless cars, where um, there's a lot of people worry about driverless cars, worry that the cars will start hitting people and we won't know why. Uh, a sort of extreme <laughs> version of this would be the like, you know, someone builds a spam filter and the spam filter um, decides that the best way to eliminate spam, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Elon Musk right now, is to kill all human beings. And so <laughs> I bring that up to bring up the, the question of sort of unintended consequences. So, yeah. um, and I feel like that's a really important topic, especially in the world of financial services, because, yeah. you know, I think part of what you know, part of what's happened in previous crises is basically the software that really smart people like yourselves uh, <laughs> design ends up, you know, uh, being used uh, in ways that that nobody anticipates. And so I guess my question is, how do you prevent me from having my own personal, you know, Lehman or my own, you know, my, <laughs> my own personal housing crisis? Um, okay, so I think that's twofold. Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, we are SEC regulated, okay? So everything that we do, every piece of advice that we give, every decision we give you is absolutely audited, right? So not just, um, not just from the perspective of being able to prove to the SEC, but from truly holding ourselves to a fiduciary standard. So first off, you know, we're not just going off and doing this without rules and boundaries. Um, second of all, every decision we recommend to the user is done in a way where we explain to the user why we're recommending this. Ultimately though, the user gets to decide if it's a yes or a no, right? So you get to avoid your own personal lehman to some extent. There is no system coming out there that's just gonna take over your finances. That will never <laughs> sell, that'll never work. I would not use that, I'm sorry. Right. So, um, so I think from that perspective, it is a very much a two-way interaction between technology and the person. How, how far do you think we are before, um, you, you know, you actually could just turn it over completely to a computer? Like just, 
like give you the computer your bank state. Look at this is a very human business matter. <laughs> yeah. uh, to what degree technology becomes developed, right? Yeah. This is a business centered around children being born, people getting married, uh, people retiring, receiving inheritances, all those types of things. There are emotional aspects that come into play to the investing process. So, so you know, it's it's. I don't think I don't ever envision it being left up to the machines to take over from yeah. here. Yeah. And the and, and the algorithms and the portfolio management uh, software. It's built on assumptions, and those assumptions are provided by tenured, experienced, you know, yeah. educated professionals. So I want to ask a business question. Um, you know, you're, you guys are charging, I think, the, the plan anyway is to charge, what, 10 bucks a month for, for the service. Um, plus, you know, if, if you're managing their money, there'll be a 25 basis point fee or whatever. Um, but I know that there's sort of, there's some sort of other interesting business opportunities that you're exploring outside the U.S. Um, John, you want to just talk about that for a second? I mean, basically, a bit. Yeah, my sense, agree. I may be getting this wrong, but I think basically uh, countries are requiring their citizens to have financial services advice, and you're trying to become like one of the players in that? So or? Australia is a great example. They have some regulatory regimes there that are requiring, you know, fiduciary level financial advice for everybody for the most. So what do you do? You either go out and hire an army of human advisors, or you find a, a complex, scalable technology solution that can deliver that type of fiduciary advice to an individual uh, at the individual level. So is that, and, is that happened? Have you made that deal or? So we, we just hired the CEO for PEF in Australia. Got it. And we we're on the very front end of building out that platform. Got it. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, in terms of like, how, how are you marketing this thing? I mean, uh, you know, especially like you're talking about millennials. Um, you know, this is a cohort that, you know, dating, which is like one of the, probably the, one of the most important things anyone does. Yeah. No one will pay to, to uh, you know, for, for online dating services. <laughs> um, you know, they, basically people don't pay for anything. And, and, and this is a, you know, it's a substantial amount of money, especially if you're talking about people who have, you know, student loan debts who are, you know, living paycheck to pay, paycheck or, or worse. I mean, how do you, how do you figure, how are you kind of getting customers and what's the plan? That's a good question. So the platforms who tried, who, who are trying to be everything to everybody are ended up being nothing to anybody, right? So you, you have to put a little thought into exactly who is a Peffin customer, who is a Peffin user. And what you find is, is that you need the financial life events that require decision making to come into play. So if you're, you know, if you're 22 and you're just in your first job and you're, you know, you may not need Peffin at that level. You just don't. If you're 25, 26, you're starting to make some income, you're paying down your student loan, uh, you know, you're looking at getting married or buying a home in five years or whatever, you're starting to have life events that require financial decision making. And that's when you kind of funnel into to being a Peffin customer is, is at those life event moments. Got it. So AI as a space is really hot right now. Um, you guys, as you said, are, are, are talking to investors, um, trying to raise money. Um, I think for a lot of us, uh, it's sort of hard to unpack the difference, I guess, between machine learning and AI and advanced software and just like plain old software. Yeah. And like, and I'm kind of curious, like, wh like how, how should we as, you know, intelligent people who read about um, companies like this, like how should we like sort of like, what should our BS detector be? Like, how should we decide, like, what's legit and what yeah. is Yeah, first, is not? Uh, don't let the word AI overwhelm you, <laughs> okay? It is an, you know, having studied it, it is an interdisciplinary field of probability, statistics, computer science, and operations research. That's what it is. Distill it down to its absolute basics. That's what it is, right? And um, the techniques in AI are like the techniques in many other STEM fields. They're tools in your toolbox. How you apply them to solve real world problems, that's the key, right? So a lot of companies can come at you and say, I built a chatbot, it's AI. Is it really AI? You know, is it doing NLP or is it a deterministic chat? Or I did Watson, yes. You did Watson, it's a Q&A system. Did you feed it all the data? 
then it's not AI. AI has a little bit of probability and statistics in it, a little uncertainty in it. And it's making decisions through that uncertainty is what makes it AI. So I would tell people you know, to, to avoid the BS factor is to really think about, okay, you call yourselves AI. What are some of the underlying techniques you're actually using? And why did you choose those techniques to solve this real world problem? It's, that's what AI is, right?